<laughs> Thank you for being here today and for supporting your local independent bookstore, which allows us to continue to offer special events and author readings like the one we have today with Margot Livesey and the flight of Gemma Hardy. <coughs> Ms. Livesey is a distinguished writer in residence at Emerson College. She's the author of six previous novels, including The Missing World, Eva Moves the Furniture, Vanishing Verona, and the Penn New England award-winning The House on Fort Fortune Street. Her most recent work, The Flight of Gemma Hardy, is a coming-of-age tale for Gemma. Um, she's a young orphan girl who has to learn to take charge of her own destiny and find her way in the world. Inspired by both Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and the landscape of Livesey's own childhood, The Flight of Gemma Hardy is a wholly original story which takes the reader from the Scottish Highlands to the Outer Orkney Islands up to Iceland. And all along the way, we're cheering on the protagonist, um, who Steve Wingate, editor at Fiction Writers Review, calls a scrappy survivor with no real place in the world who will land on her feet and create one. Kind of like a cat when I read that. I thought it was a great way to, to think of Gemma. So Gemma Hardy is a delight, and I'm delighted to ask your help in welcoming Margot Livesey here this afternoon. Thank you, John. Thank you all for coming to a bookshop on Sunday afternoon. I really, really appreciate it. And it's lovely to see some wonderful writers in the audience and some old friends and some strangers. It's just what I would hope for. And if you're at the back, you're going to have to signal if I need to speak more loudly. I do need to speak more loudly. Okay. I'll try to shout. Is that better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, if I stop shouting, just gesture or <laughs> heel over or something. Um, I'm going to read two short sections from The Flight of Gemma Hardy, but I wanted to begin with a letter written by a young woman in 1847 to Messrs. Smith and Elder, August 24th, 1847. I now send you, per rail, a manuscript entitled Jane Eyre, a novel in three volumes by Currer Bell. I find I cannot prepay the carriage of the parcel, as money for that purpose is not received at the, at the small station house where it is left. If, when you acknowledge the receipt of the manuscript, you would have the goodness to mention the amount charged on delivery I will immediately transmit it in postage stamps. It is better in future to address Mr. Currabell under cover to Miss Bronte, Haworth, Bradford, Yorkshire, as there is a risk of letters otherwise directed not reaching me at present. To save trouble, I enclose an envelope. Um, this um, letter and the manuscript um, made its way successfully to, from Yorkshire to London and it was published um, a little less than two months later on October 19th, 1847 and has never been out of print since that time. Mm -hmm. And I read this letter to my publisher, Harper Collins, to tease them because <laughs> um, publishing used to be a very speedy business compared to nowadays. <laughs> um, I'm going to read just a, a page and a half from the opening chapter, and then I'm going to read chapter two in its entirety, but be assured it is only four pages. <laughs> and then I'm hoping you will ask me questions. We did not go for a walk on the first day of the year. The Christmas snow had melted and rain had been falling since dawn, darkening the shrubbery and muddying the grass. But that would not have stopped my aunt from dispatching us. She believed in the benefits of fresh air for children in all weather. Later, I understood, she also enjoyed the peace and quiet of our absence. No, the cause of our not walking was my cousin Will, who claimed his cold was too severe to leave the sitting room sofa, but not so bad that he couldn't play cards. His sister Louise, he insisted, must stay behind for a game of racing demon. 
I overheard these negotiations from the corridor where I loitered holding my aunt's black shoes, freshly polished, one in each hand. In that case, said my aunt, Veronica and Gemma can walk to the farm to collect the eggs. Oh, must I, Mum, said Veronica. She's such a... The door to my uncle's study was only a few feet away across the corridor. Hastily, I opened it, stepped inside, and shut out whatever came next. Not long ago, this room had been the centre of the house, a place brightened by my uncle's energy, made tranquil by his concentration as he worked on his sermons. But last February, skating alone on the river at dusk, he had fallen through the ice, and now I was the only one who spent any time here, or who seemed to miss him. Just inside the door was a pyramid of cardboard boxes, the remains of my aunt's several recent purchases. But beyond the boxes, the room was as he had left it. His pen still lay on the desk beside the sermon he'd been preparing. At the top of the page he had written, Sunday, 16th February, Anno Domini, 1958. No man is an island. Setting the shoes on the floor and trying not to imagine how Veronica had finished her sentence. Such a copycat, such a moron. I'd read over my uncle's opening paragraph. We each begin as an island, but we soon build bridges. Even the most solitary person has, perhaps without knowing it, a causeway, a cable, a line of stepping stones connecting him or her to others, allowing for the possibility of communication and affection. As I read the familiar phrases, I pictured myself as a small verdant island in a grey sea. When the tide went out, a line of rocks surfaced, joining me to another island, or the mainland. The image bore no relation to my present life. Neither my aunt nor my cousins wanted any connection with me. <coughs> but I cherished the hope that one day my uncle's words would prove true. Someone would appear at the other end of the causeway. I stepped over to the bookcase and pulled down one of my favourite books, Birds of the World. Each page showed a bird in its natural habitat a puffin with its fat, gaudy beak peering out of a burrow, a lyrebird spreading its tail beneath a leafy tree, accompanied by a description. Usually I read, curled in the armchair beside the fire, conjuring an imaginary warmth from the cold embers. But today, not wanting to reveal my presence by turning on the light, I settled myself on the window seat. Pulling the heavy green curtain around me, I flew away into the pictures. I might just mention that my uh, grandfather was a, a minister, a, a minister in the Church of England. And at one point I had a project of interviewing some of his parishioners. He died before I was born. And to a woman and a man, they reported that Mr. Livesey had been a very nice man but that his sermons were dull as ditch water. <laughs> so I saw it something of, as something of a challenge to escape my inheritance of writing, I think, four sentences that were not dull, I hope. <laughs> um, chapter two. The story of my parents was, according to my uncle, a tale of heroism and true love. To my aunt, an example of stupidity and stubbornness. They had met in 1943 when my mother Agnes, a wren, was posted to Iceland and my father, a man who had grown up in the shadow of glaciers and geysers, was working on the new docks in Reykjavik. After only four months Agnes had returned to Scotland but they had kept faith, sent letters and made romantic arrangements that involved looking at the North Star. They had planned to meet after the war, but then my mother found herself back in Edinburgh, taking care of her father, 
who'd had a stroke. My uncle described the tall, stern house near the botanical gardens and their small, stern parents. They could have hired a nurse, he told me, but our mother wouldn't hear of strangers in the house. She was never the same after my brother's death. My uncle was already married and in his first parish in Aberdeen, he hadn't known of my father's existence for nearly a year. Then a church council meeting brought him to Edinburgh. On the second day of his visit, he had insisted Agnes take a walk with him in the botanical gardens. Even to get your grandmother to consent to that, he told me, was a tussle. What if something happens, she kept asking. It was then that I began to realise what your mother's life was like and why she was so pale. The only time she left the house were to do the shopping or fetch the doctor or go to church. It was May and the azaleas were in full bloom. Agnes kept going from bush to bush, smelling the flowers, exclaiming. My uncle and I were walking too, along the track that led to the footbridge over the river. It was a still afternoon in early autumn and nothing seemed to move except the two of us and the sheep grazing in the nearby fields. We stopped in the middle of the bridge. My uncle leaned over the railings and I looked through them. The summer before the war, he went on, my father took us fishing on Speyside. My brother and I were hopeless, but right from the start, Agnes had the knack. She could find the fish when no one else could. She told me how one day when she wasn't on duty, your father took her out in his boat and showed her the schools of herring. They made their own waves, she said. I should have walked her home from the botanical gardens right then and put her on the next boat to Iceland. My parents wrote faithfully and eventually, in 1946, three months after my grandfather's funeral, my father travelled to Scotland. They were married in my uncle's church. He asked if I knew what the word radiant meant. And when I shook my head, he explained it meant giving out light, like the lamp in the sitting room that was shaped like a lady wearing a crinoline. That was how my mother had looked on her wedding day. My father too. They had sailed to Iceland that night. From her new home, my mother wrote wonderful letters. She had fallen in love with the country and with my father's small fishing village. She learned Icelandic and made a garden among the rocks. She and my father had come back to Edinburgh only once in 1948 so that I could be born in a Scottish hospital. The last time I saw her, said my uncle, she couldn't have been happier. I was born in April and that summer when I was still too young to crawl and the seas were calm, my mother and I often went out in my father's boat. I pictured the two of us in the bow, watching the waves while my father in the stern cast his nets. But one day, so, sorry, but one day, the following spring, shortly after my first birthday, we stayed home and went for a walk instead. My mother slipped on some seaweed and protecting me, hit her head on a rock. She picked herself up, brought me home, made a cup of tea and took two aspirin. By the time my father returned, there was a lump the size of a hen's egg on the back of her head but she insisted she was fine, just tired. My father put me to bed and made supper. In the morning, she didn't wake up. For the next two years, I lived with my father. A neighbor minded me while he fished. Then one pleasant August afternoon, he didn't come home. The neighbor said he must have found an enormous school of herring. He was following them, filling his nets. He would be back tomorrow. The next afternoon I saw the blue hull of his boat rounding the harbour wall. I ran to meet it 
but the man at the tiller was a fisherman from the next village. When he stepped ashore, I hurled myself at his knees, demanding my father. The man knelt down so that his face was level with mine and said something that made no sense. My father had drowned. I came to meet the boats the next day and the next and the next. Whatever the weather, I insisted on going down to the harbour. I wish I ran up to each man in turn. Surely one of them would be my father. Several times I tried to stow away on a boat, but I was always discovered. If only I was allowed to look, I knew I could find him. I'm not sure how many days or weeks later a strange man arrived, speaking in a language I didn't understand. I hid in terror behind the neighbour. She showed me a photograph that stood on my mother's chest of drawers and pointed first to the man in the photograph, then to the man standing a few feet away. Your uncle, she said. Later, he told me that as a boy, he had once tamed a fox cub and that the process of befriending me was similar. Mostly he sat and waited for me to approach or did things, sang, played bowls that he thought might interest me. Then one day, my uncle and the neighbour explained that I was going to a place called Scotland where he and his family lived. I would have a brother and sisters an aunt. The next day we packed and the day after that we drove to the city and boarded a boat bigger than any I'd ever seen. The voyage took two days and I spent every minute of daylight on deck hoping to see my father, his head or his arm, even a sea boot above the waves. When my uncle asked me to come to meals I explained why I couldn't. He'd found a sailor to translate for us, but the man's English was uncertain. It took several exchanges before my uncle understood. Then he sat down beside me to scan the watery horizon. Sometimes, for a minute or two, a seal or a cormorant raised my hopes. I wept bitterly when land appeared. For the first time, I believed my father was dead. Worse was to follow. As we drove along streets of grey buildings, it dawned on me that we were leaving the sea behind. I remember little of the drive to Yew House. We stopped several times for petrol or food and once for me to go behind a wall. Every trip I had ever made had begun and ended with the sea. But as the sun set, we drove into a small village with no water in sight. My uncle pointed out his church. No, I said, my first English word. We drove along a narrow road between fields of black-faced sheep and up a drive lined with rhododendrons, shadowed by beech trees and firs. How dreary it seemed closed in with trees. How silent without the sea to sing a lullaby. I still cherished some small hope that this was only temporary. My uncle had come to visit me, now I was going to visit him. But when we reached the stone house at the top of the drive and my uncle led me past a round tree and through the front door, I knew I would never see my father again, never walk down to the jetty to greet the fishing boats and laugh at the crabs scuttling over the rocks, never see the beady-eyed gulls waiting to pounce on fish scraps. Never watch the snow fall day after day after day. I was inconsolable, and this, surely, was the beginning of my difficulties with my aunt. I howled every time she approached. I refused to talk to her or to my cousins. I spoke only with my uncle. He neglected his own children to teach me English, and that winter nursed me through first measles and then tonsillitis. Gradually, I forgot my Iceland home, forgot my father and our village that was almost part of the sea. I went to school, played with my cousins, dogged my uncle's footsteps, 
and enjoyed his praise of my reading and writing and sums. I had a home and a family. It had taken me almost a year to understand that with his death, I had once again lost both. The true nature of my relations with my cousins and my aunt, like the branches of an elm tree in winter, became clear. Thank you. There are a couple of seats at the front if anyone wants to be right under my scrutiny. <laughs> Um, I would be happy to entertain questions. Answer them. <laughs> if you have any. Yes. I recently finished your book and for myself to come in and actually see you and hear you, I would like to thank you. It was a fascinating novel. Um, my definition is if you can't put a book down, then it's a novel. And so I want to thank you. I really enjoyed it. My question to you is, um, what kind of brainstorming do you do and what elements are involved when you start any, like, okay, go with this novel, the birth of a novel, because this young lady in the book, the, the life experiences that she has to come up against seem so unsurmountable, but yet she just has that inner strength. So how did you come, how did you start this whole brainstorming idea? To, for, for this particular novel and the way that you took off with it. Did everyone hear the question? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for such a lovely question, um, and especially for your opening remarks. Um, uh, well, um, in the case of The Flight of Gemma Hardy, I had a number of ambitions. I really wanted to create not just a character, but a heroine. I wanted to create, and by heroine, I mean someone a bit larger than life, who will have to go out into the world and slay dragons and overcome huge difficulties and hopefully will triumph. So that was part of my opening ambitions for Gemma. And I think there was an element, of course, of, um, do I mean wish fulfillment in this? I wanted to write about someone who is in a number of respects very different than myself. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to write a little bit about myself, and I gave Gemma some things in common with me. I gave her um, some of the Scottish landscapes I knew best. I gave her a difficult aunt instead of my very difficult stepmother. <laughs> um, I gave her a boarding school even worse than the one that I myself attended. <laughs> Which was sort of like having it both ways. I got my revenge on the dreadful school I attended <laughs> and had a good time um, writing it. Um, so, I, so I had those rather, perhaps rather inchoate ambitions. Um, I also aspired to do something very presumptuous, to write a novel that in some way wrote back to Charlotte Bronte's great novel. And to do that by beginning with a girl the same age as Jane Eyre, in somewhat comparable circumstances, but much closer to our present time. In fact, I chose the time very specifically because I thought it'd be interesting to write about that period just before the great tidal wave of feminism and equal rights broke over both, broke over both Scotland and the States. Um, so, and at least in Scotland, the swinging 60s didn't show up for the most part till about 1970. So I, I thought <laughs> the early and mid 60s was a perfect time to set the novel. Um, but so all of those things were in my in my head as I started to write. I did not have I did not write an outline to start with. Um, I did not. I had a, a kind of state of a state of being I was traveling towards. I wanted my heroine to at least in a limited way triumph, but I wasn't quite sure how many obstacles she would have to overcome to do that. And I did know that the novel would be structured like many heroic novels as a journey. I mean, I think it's one of our oldest, oldest art forms, the journey. Does that sort of answer your question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> more, more questions? Mm -hmm. 
So I have to say I've read some interviews <laughs> with you about this book, so I, I, I feel like I know a bit, but I, but I want to know more about being so, um, I suppose one could use the adjectives that uh, Gemma's uh, aunt and uncle used to describe her parents' marriage, either one of you, either it was very foolish of you or very courageous of you to take on writing a book that speaks at all to, to Jane Eyre and um, obviously a very special relationship with that novel and in one of your interviews you talked about that as an important book of your childhood. But I'm curious about how much you looked to it directly while you were working on this book. Did you set it completely aside? Did you find that you had a dialogue with it? Did you find out new things about it at this stage in your life that, that did it look like a different book to you? So how exactly did the book Jane Eyre figure in the actual writing, not just the inspiration? Did everyone hear this question? Yeah. The asker of the question is the wonderful author, Julie Glass. <laughs> <laughs> Three Junes and the Brido uh -huh. Brido and the Tame Man of Margo Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I read Jane Eyre um, when I was just a little bit younger than Jane herself is, and one of the things that drew me into the book was reading about someone almost my own age. And since that time, I have reread the novel quite a number of times, often to teach it to not always completely receptive people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I had, I had always passionately identified with Jane Eyre for a number of the autobiographical reasons that I just described. Um, the Scottish moors outside my window, the Gothic boarding boys' boarding school where my father taught that you could imagine was Thornfield Hall, mm -hmm. the stepmother, etc., etc. I thought, oh, she's writing about me, she's writing about me. Um, and I had never thought, however, of writing back to Jane Eyre until I was in a, a bookshop in Boston um, talking to a book club about Jane Eyre. And almost everyone in the room was, I think I can say, American. Um, no one in the room that I remember confessed to being an orphan. Um, people seemed to have come from robust, happy families. They hadn't grown up in the Gothic shadows of a boys' school or attended dreadful schools. But they all identified passionately with Jane Eyre as well. And I realized I'd been making a very traditional reader's mistake of thinking Bronte wrote the novel just for me and I appreciated it especially because of my circumstances. And it was shortly after that evening that I went home and hid Jane, my copy of Jane Eyre so well that in fact I haven't been able to find it and had to go and buy a new one last week. <laughs> <laughs> and found myself writing that opening sentence, we did not go, for, I mean in Jane Eyre, it's we did not go for a walk that day I think. Um, um, and then, of course, I was just horrified at what I was doing. What was I doing? Thinking, you know, I mean, Jane Eyre has never been out of print. We don't need another Jane Eyre. But somehow, you know, from chapter to chapter, I just kept wanting to tell Gemma's story. And I'd look up periodically and think, this is, a, this is ghastly. And then I'd put my head down and write some more. Um, and some of the hardest parts were, of course, some of the most famous parts of Jane Eyre. And, trying to decide how to how to respond to them, how to write around them or write back to them or ignore them or play with them. Because I really wanted to write a novel that could be appreciated by those who did know Bronte's novel, but also by people like the person with whom I share a house who had never read Jane Eyre and have no plans to. So it was very, <laughs> <laughs> it was very important to me that my novel was its own story, um, and I have um, I have not yet reread Bronte because I, I want to I don't want to go into a major depression and have to go to Maclean's. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, I, I, although I bought my new copy, I probably won't be rereading it for a little while, <laughs> but I'm sure I will. Um, and I'll just say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm babbling here, but I will just say that I did know that I did not want to do what Jane Smiley did in A Thousand Acres, really transport every scene from King Lear to Iowa. I knew I didn't want that kind of faithful retelling. That had no appeal for me. So it had to be something more, more circuitous, more playful, um, more its own story, I hope. Yes. Um, the question, I'm not sure if everyone will report that, was about how wonderfully atmospheric and evocative 
Scotland is and how lucky I am, I think, to have that as my homeland. Um, and am I going to keep writing about it? And I will say that I have started a new novel and um, I am trying to do something that strikes me as even more presumptuous than the flight of Gemma Hardy. I'm trying to write about America. <laughs> so <laughs> my American friends should run for the hills because <laughs> I'm following you with my notebook. I'm writing down what you say, <laughs> paying huge attention to your childhood, <laughs> and your eating habits and all those, what you did at school and all those crucial things. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I have to confess that at least one character in the pages I have so far um, has a strong connection with Scotland. So I'm complete, you know, it's, it's kind of I'm weaning myself from trying to. But I do feel that, um, yeah, that there is something very atmospheric about Scotland. And um, I love writing about it. I love writing about the layers of history and the layers of folklore and all those things. Mm. Yes. Um, I've tried to answer that question about Iceland without revealing too much of my plot. Um, I, I, as I said, I wanted the novel to be, a, to be a journey, and I also wanted to stake my claim to my own territory. And if you remember um, Jane Eyre, <laughs> then you know that Jane turns out, she thinks she's an orphan, but she turns out to have an uncle in Madeira. And of course, that uncle in Madeira, summoned by the letter she writes to him, destroys her first attempt at marriage with Rochester. So I started thinking, oh, maybe my character, although she's Scottish, doesn't have to be entirely Scottish. Um, but if she's not going to be entirely Scottish, where will she? Where could she be from? And I knew from my reading of Scottish history that Iceland was part of the old Viking Empire, and so there were. For, you know, for thousands of years there were trade routes from Denmark to the Orkneys to Iceland. Um, they were linked by trade, by culture, um, sometimes by government. And so Iceland struck me as a perfect and very romantic place for Gemma to be from. And it had some of the things that I found tremendously appealing, that namely it looks like a very old landscape but it's actually a very new landscape all those volcanoes mm -hmm. coming and going and it has wonderful um, birds um, and birds are one of the themes running through the novel so I was happy to be able to have more birds come and go um, and it also made possible a certain element of my plot because it has a very small population <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'll be happy to do more on behalf of the Iceland Tourist Board. <laughs> they have more. They have more Icelandic ponies than people. Um, the Prime Minister's phone number is in the phone book. <laughs> um, there's a there's a, a place where you can swim between the tectonic plates that make up Europe and America, and you can actually touch Europe and America. <laughs> How cool is that? And if you're not a vegetarian, you can eat roast puffin, which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not, not, not a challenge I rose to. Yes. Um, you said a little while back, uh, referring to Jane Eyre, some of the more difficult passages that you were either comparing or working with. I wondered which ones they were. And number two, off the subject, who in the movies or in a TV production is your favorite representation of Jane Eyre? Gosh, um, the question is which were the most difficult parts of Jane Eyre to negotiate and which is my favorite cinematic representation of Jane Eyre? Um, well, I think that if you ask most people who have read Jane Eyre what they remember, their memories are, as memories so often are, a little askew and they remember the dreadful school and the scenes at Thornfield Hall. And they block out, for the most part, the religiosity, for instance, um, goes by most people. The fact that the book ends with almost a little sermon about Christianity and St. John. Um, so I think the hardest part was to negotiate was what to do about Mr. Rochester. Um, the most dated part of the novel, the part that if you actually and not a wildly passionate young girl reading it, you think, oh my God, this man is actually not that pleasant a lot of the time. He's, <laughs> he's quite cruel, he's very conscious of his power. Um, 
And, you know, it's a tribute to Bronte's skill that so many readers have believed in what is a frankly deeply implausible relationship, mm -hmm. this aristocrat marrying a governess. I mean, it is so, so far-fetched. Um, but he is often quite unkind to her. And so all of that, I had to sort of think about, well, what, what am I going to do with that? And, um, you know, anyway, I won't tell you what I did to, but um, it, it was a particular, a particular challenge for me. Um, and as for the cinematic versions of Jane Eyre, I did like the most recent one quite a bit. Um, I oh, with that Maya? Um, Maya, Maya the Polish something. Name. She's yeah. Australian. Yeah, she was brilliant. Face. I thought she, she yeah. Was, yeah, I thought she had such an interesting face. Mm -hmm. And I liked the one that came out, I want to say, in the early 90s or late 80s. Um, I'm not quite sure of the date. And I confess I haven't yet seen the earlier ones, although I'm meant to be writing a little article about films films of Jane Eyre, so that lies in my future. Mm -hmm. Do you have one you'd recommend? Well, a lot of them. We sort of end up comparing Mr. Rochester's <laughs> as we did with Mr. Darcy. Yeah. But um, of course the original one, wasn't it, uh, Joan Fontaine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And then there was uh, George C. Scott who played in Mr. Rochester, but it's been interesting how, and Timothy Dalton was another one, but they're all portrayed differently, but it's, it's been interesting. Yeah how the relationship develops. I mean, the trouble with film, I think, is that it's very literal. So you're actually forced to confront things that in the book you kind of, your imagination just glides over. And you suddenly think, oh, that's really what's happening. It's, so it can be quite startling. Other questions? Yes. I'm always interested in people's writing rhythms. I, I gather Julie is a first writer, and then periods of um, she's not writing. Are you? Um, do you have a rhythm to how you approach a book? I mean, do you put it down and not pick it up for months, or you slow and steady wins the race? Do you do it every day? <laughs> well, um, the question is about my writing process and, and um, whether I have a routine. I'd, I'd say um, I, I aspire to have a routine, and I aspire not to be imprisoned by that routine. If that makes sense. So when I was a younger writer, I mean, it was I had all these sort of I am I am the kind of writer who can only write in the morning with this kind of cup of coffee and that kind of you know everything had to be right. But gradually, I realised as I got older that circumstances were often going to be less than ideal, and that. If I really wanted to keep writing, I would have to find ways around those unideal circumstances. So now I aspire to write in the morning, but if I can't, I'll write in the afternoon. If I can't write in the afternoon, I'll try to do something, something just to keep the connection going in the evening. Um, even if it's rereading pages or rereading a poem, reading the, that might teach me something about language or looking at some maps or whatever will keep will keep the writing going but um, I do tend to try to work every day and I, I mean that, that is what I aspire to um, but not not the case happily at the moment I'm, I'm allowed out of my room to meet people so that's quite, that's quite exciting for me I don't always know if I'm behaving appropriately because it's so exciting <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. back to the the topic itself of the book, I, it just occurred to me, I was just remembering White Sargasso Sea, the Jean Riss yeah. novel, which also responds to yeah. Jane Eyre in yes. a very specific way, and I'm, I'm wondering if that entered into your thinking at all, if that was something, if your interest in addressing a novel extends to other people's addressing that I novel, or... No, thank you. Um, the question is about Jean Rhys's Wide Sargasso Sea, in which Jean Rhys um, writes about the first Mrs. Bertha, Roch yeah. first Mrs. Rochester, Bertha Rochester, and gives a very creates a very sympathetic portrait of this woman who is quite marginalised in Jane Eyre. Um, I am in. I have long been interested in the project of writers writing back to mm -hmm. other authors, paying homage in various ways. So. You know, I read, for instance, Sadie Smith's on beauty with interest, mm -hmm. thinking, oh, now how does this connect with Howard's End? It must be among my favorite novels. And mm -hmm. 
you know, and poets, of course, too, have a long, a long tradition of writing back to other poets. And then, you know, we have Tom Stoppard, you know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think most art forms do, well, do look, do look yeah. back. I mean, music, painting. Certainly in painting and yeah, music. Um, and there's always that reference. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's something very interesting about it if you can do it in a way that isn't sort of too, too, too closed yeah. or too, too obvious. And of course, it does carry a certain risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I have been taken to task for my project and... Um, is that right? And I, yes. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> and I, oh. so I am, um, um, I'm conscious that to some people it's not an appealing idea to, mm. to write back. Mm. Mm. Well, and I haven't read the new P.D. James, but I hear, um, what is it, mm -hmm. Death Comes Death to Pemberley? Is that Pemberley, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I hear good things about it, and if I'm still wearing a raincoat and looking as good as she does at her age, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a happy woman. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, the art speaker spoke about his own classical education, which involved reading Jane Eyre, and how you can, how there are, aren't really rules. You can do what you want to do in art if you're doing it honestly, doing it in a heartfelt way. So thank you, thank you very much for, for saying that. And of course, I too had a kind of classical education, as you as you can probably tell. So thank you. Perhaps just one more question before and I'll be happy to answer questions. I, I was just curious, um, the process of getting your book published, um, did you present to your publisher an outline or the whole theme of this book that you were right now you're right talking about? And did um, they in, what do they think of it? Um, the question is how did I go about <coughs> getting this published and what did my publisher think of it? Um, I um, have worked with the same editor for several novels and the same agent for several novels. Um, I just said vaguely for two, for two years, maybe two and a half years, I said vaguely, oh, I'm working on something. <laughs> don't, don't you worry about me, I'm working on something. Um, and I sent the manuscript without comment to my agent saying I would welcome your input. Um, and um, I didn't mention that I was looking back at any Victorian novels. I didn't, I didn't offer any commentary whatsoever. Um, so they read the novel, my agent and my editor, you know, in, a, in an early draft. And um, they did indeed provide quite a lot of feedback. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, they decided they would publish it. So, so, so I they felt were positive about it. So they were, yeah, no. And, um, you, you know, they, I mean, I didn't say you'd give them an outline or do, or do right. any of those things. I mean, I wanted to write, selfishly, I wanted to write the novel I wanted to write before too many people offered me their opinions. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, people will offer you their opinions. <laughs> <laughs> but by this time, if you're speaking about Gemma Hardy, you had published five or six other successful novels. How was it at the beginning? Oh, how was it when I first started trying to publish? Um, well, I'll just tell you very briefly. Um, I uh, started writing because I was traveling with my boyfriend at the time after I'd finished my degree at the University of York and he was writing a book and thought, hey, if he's going to write a book, I'll write a book too. <laughs> you know, something like that. But, but, but you know, I couldn't, I couldn't keep going to visit churches and markets and ruins on my own, and it was sort of lonely. So um, anyway, during our year of travel, I wrote a novel of just remarkable badness, <laughs> which I still have in my study in, in North Cambridge as a kind of, I don't know, memento mori or memento something. <laughs> um, but the badness really interested me. I thought, why is it that after so much reading and writing essays about Middlemarch and um, thinking about Ford Maddox Ford, I'm just writing so, I'm so little influenced by the books I love. I mean, I would love to be more influenced by my reading. Wouldn't it be great if you could just read something magnificent and then, and and then just be influenced? I mean, that would be fabulous. <laughs> Such was not my case, and so I, but I did recognize that 400 pages was a kind of exhausting way to make mistakes, and I decided I would write short stories, 
which fitted better with the fact that I was waitressing and I was working split shifts, so I would write <laughs> before I went in for lunch and then between lunch and dinner. Um, and eventually, um, a few of these stories crept into print um, in Canadian magazines. I was living mostly in Toronto at that time. And um, then one day I was reading the Toronto Globe and Mail. Sorry, this is more detail than you need, but it's, we're nearly at the end. I was reading the Toronto Globe and Mail, and there was an uh, article about uh, an editor at Penguin Books in Toronto and how she had just started publishing collections of short stories. And the editor's name was rather wonderfully Cynthia Good. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote Cynthia Good a letter and I sent her two stories. And nothing happened for nine months. Nothing whatsoever happened for nine months. And then I got back a little letter, not full size eight by 11, but you know, that, kind of, yeah. Yeah, that kind of size, saying, um, dear Margot Livesey, I would like to publish your stories, but you have to write some more. <laughs> um, and that changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, and then I discovered, oh, there were people called agents. Maybe I could get one. <laughs> <laughs> and then I met a few other people who wrote fiction. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, before that, I'd really been, you know, waitressing and writing, writing in the library. So um, I, I feel deeply fortunate. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for these wonderful questions. Mm -hmm. and coming